Welcome to episode one of the Liberator podcast from Free the States. My name is Russell Hunter. I'm here with James Silberman and Sam Riley. And uh, this is our first podcast, and uh, we're looking forward to doing this and wanted to just uh, come right out of the gate explaining why it is that we're called the Liberator podcast, Uh, kind of talk about our namesake and all that kind of thing. Uh, But just to be clear for everyone tuning in, this is an abolitionist podcast. Free the States is an abolitionist organization. Uh, We stand for, call for, work towards the total and immediate abolition of abortion as murder. We think abortion is a murderous crime. It is sin. There is forgiveness for the sin of abortion, but that doesn't mean it should be legal. And so Free the States, um, our mission is to uh, go from state to state, abolishing abortion everywhere we can. Um, We're not into... Uh, sort of this incremental regulatory schemes that so many pro-life organizations uh, focus on. Uh, We are not focused on that. And in this podcast, we are not going to be focused on it either. So if you're a pro-lifer and you're watching this, you know, that's awesome. Uh, We're not going to be coming at this from a pro-life perspective. We're going to be coming at this from an abolitionist perspective. Um, So the Liberator podcast, James Silverman and Sam Riley, two former pro-lifers. Hanging out. Our, 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 uh, our, our, our episode two is going to be on like how we ourselves move from the pro-life position to the abolitionist position. Um, but yeah, you guys ready to go? Yeah. We're going to do this. Mm-hmm. Um, so out, out the gate, uh, one of the things that I think we need to just talk about in, in saying that we are an abolitionist organization and this is an abolitionist podcast, some people have a major problem with that. It's a pretty bold claim. Yeah, some people like and people are, like often don't even like the differentiation that you're using different language from them too. Yeah, they don't. They they think that one. They usually think we're just trying to like come up with something neat for us, like to separate them, and and, and that's not what it's about. Um, but like, oftentimes you say like, "I am an abolitionist of abortion. You should be an abolitionist too." The pro lifer is like, "What's the difference?" And you try to tell them the difference and say, well, "There really is no difference," and they have a really big problem with us sort of like making a line and saying, you need to cross this line. It, you know, ticks them off. And, um, the other, the other problem is that they, they say that the way that we try to get people to repent of being pro-life is too harsh. It's too, um, too stark making that, that, that line. Or it's totally unneeded. Yeah, it's unneeded. But then some people, some will say, okay, I get it. There's differences, but do you have to be a jerk about it? You know, like I agree with you. Um, Pro-life incrementalism is bad. Regulationism is bad. Abolitionism is good. But did you have to call that pro-life bill a namby-pamby, abolition-delaying, abortion-permitting, iniquitous decree? Like you call, I, I stayed up all night long arguing for that iniquitous decree, and you, you said, whoa, on them. You know, when, too when harsh. I was a pro-lifer, I actually wrote iniquitous decrees with that, you know, capitalized and uncapitalized thing to an abolitionist. And I angrily, you know, sent it to them because I was so annoyed. (laughs) (laughs) Nicholas Dequeries. Yeah. Like, so whenever I was an abolitionist arguing with you as a pro-lifer and you were like, dude, like Mm -hmm. you were mad at me, right? Yeah. I was putting that in, you know, biblical language. I was mad that they were throwing the Bible at me. It was annoying. Yeah. No, I saw a guy on the abolitionism page the other day. He was arguing with an abolitionist and he actually, he was like, iniquitous decrees you're just making stuff up that's not even that's not even that's the dumbest thing i've ever heard and then of course some abolitionist comes along and is like it's from the bible and he's like well you should have put like a you know verse address or something you know he didn't really you know. but but you know i think that you know not to get off track i think that a lot of uh good solid well-meaning pro-life people who see abolitionist debating with pro-lifers think that we are coming across too harsh or that we're creating an, an unnecessary dividing line. Um, so that that's kind of a question. And, and we are, I think we're resolved that, that the line is necessary, that it is real. And that sometimes to get people to see that line and to cross it, you got to be somewhat harsh, mm-hmm. stark in it. You might say harshest truth, harshest truth, which actually brings us uh, to to the name the name of the podcast. Good job, James. This is the Liberator Podcast, 
And uh, some of you are thinking, what does that have to do with abortion and all like, like liberator? You know, what is that? Well, in the 19th century, sort of like the leading voice of immediate abolition, William, Lay Gar- William Lloyd Garrison, he started a periodical, a weekly newsprint uh, periodical called The Liberator. And uh, that's our historical precursor. That's our namesake. And, and in many ways, it's our inspiration. And, uh, and, and famously, in, in the opening, uh, what is it? What was it called? Editorial at the time? Opening editorial. The opening editorial. To the public. To the public. William Lloyd Garrison just comes right out, and, and he makes that famous quote that I think most people watching this have probably seen. I will be as harsh as truth and as uncompromising as justice. You got it right there, James, to read the whole thing? Yeah. So this here, this is a quote that you'll see a lot of places. A lot of you probably recognize it. So he writes... I am aware that many object to the severity of my language, but is there not cause for severity? I will be as harsh as truth and as uncompromising as justice. On this subject, I do not wish to, to think or speak or write with moderation. No, no. Tell a man whose house is on fire to give a moderate alarm. Tell him to moderately rescue his wife from the hand of the ravisher. Tell the mother to gradually extricate her babe from the fire into which it has fallen. But urge me not to use moderation in a cause like the present. Yeah. And then right after that, that's the, he, this is another part that's often quoted the, I am in earnest. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will not retreat a single inch and I will be heard. So I think if anyone's familiar with William Lloyd Garrison at all, like the minimal amount, you've probably seen this quote. Like if you type in William Lloyd Garrison quotes, this is going to be the one that pops up. And, uh, and, and I remember back in 2010, 2011, when I began really reading and studying the American abolitionists of slavery, uh, you know, I, I thought, man, these guys are brilliant. They write brilliant. This is really good. And then I noticed that even, you know, like I, where I saw this quote was from pro-lifers. Like it, this, uh, this kind of quote was appearing on like pro-life memes. And I can't remember what it was, but it was like, you know, Americans United for Life or something. And it was like, I'll be you know, I'm not going to (laughs) equivocate and all this kind of stuff. And of course I'm looking at it and I'm studying the pro-life movement. I'm like, that's all you do is kind of retreat inch after inch and equivocate and moderate. And so all this stuff. But, um, yeah, so pro-lifers use this quote as well. I've seen this quote used a lot of places, but by pro-lifers as well. Um, but there's a section immediately preceding that quote, um, that, uh, I think would would cause a lot of pro-lifers to maybe stop using the quote, yeah. or at least rethink um, rethink using it, rethink their position, yeah. Especially their if they, position. If they if they know anything about like the argument between abolitionists today, yeah, and pro-lifers, they're and if they understood the the context of this quote, they would not use it, yeah, because it's yeah. on our side. Well, I so. think yeah. When I first read this, I thought all the abolitionist historical abolitionism was just exaggerated and they didn't actually say anything like this. But uh, <laughs> reading the actual quote, it's like, right. in Park Tr- Street Church on the 4th of July, 1829, in an address on slavery, I unreflectingly assented to the popular but pernicious doctrine of gradual abolition. I seize this opportunity to make a full and unequivocal recantation and thus publicly to ask pardon of my God, of my country, and of my brethren, the poor slaves, for having uttered a sentiment so full of timidity, injustice, and absurdity. Yeah. A similar recantation from my pen was published in the Genius of Universal Emancipation at Baltimore in September 1829. My conscience is now my conscience is now satisfied. Yeah. yeah. So Russell, you, you talked earlier, you know, or you, you mentioned earlier about, about repentance, right? Of yeah. of pro life incrementalism. And that's you know, whoa, I mean that's that seems abrasive. Right. Um, but Garrison here is saying even though it wasn't something I held to fiercely or anything, it just something I, I, it was popular. And so I just kind of unreflectingly not thinking a whole ton about it, mm-hmm. just kind of went along with it. Yeah. So and it, of that sort of following the spirit of the age type thing. Yeah. It was going along with the multitude. Just right. That all the people who were against slavery were like against slavery and pro colonization. Yeah. Pro gradual emancipation. Um, the, so like when Garrison is coming into this battle um, underneath uh, a Quaker editor, friend of his, Benjamin Lundy, who is a gradualist colonizationist, um, but very awesome in his uh, opposition to slavery. Slavery is sin. 
slaves should be set free, all this kind of stuff. But I think Garrison just comes, it just goes along with all the anti-slavery people. They're all basically saying the answer to this is colonization. And so there's, at the time, there's this uh, American Colonization Society. It's this big organization, but for all intents and purposes, that's the movement. If you're anti-slavery in the North, you give money to the American Colonization Society. Every year, there's sort of like a Sanctity of Life Sermon Sunday. But at this point, it's usually done each year around July 4th. Um, and it's whenever they have people give sermons on the evils of slavery and take up money for the American Colonization Society. And so Garrison, as he's getting into this battle as a young man, he's asked to give an address at Park Street Church, um, and he gets up and he he's riveting. He's calling for the church to repent. He's saying slavery is evil. He's saying we need to get out there and, you know, we inconsistent, hypocritical Christianity if we don't love our neighbors, the, the slaves. Really great thing, but then towards the end of it, he's just sort of like, and, and we should support the Colonization Society. Well, after some time goes by and he sits and he reflects upon it, he, he, he thinks back through just the idea of gradual abolition. He's like, if I were a slave, would I want people calling for gradual abolition? He's thinking about that. At the time he's sitting, he, he's a member of Lyman Beecher's church. And Lyman Beecher is sort of like the orthodox um, uh, preaching pastor at the time. And uh, Garrison's in his church and Lyman Beecher is preaching uh, against sin and says that the sinner, when he sees sin in his life, ought to repent instantly. Uh, if you're dealing with a sin, you repent instantly. You know, looking at passages from the Word of God, that's how Jesus teaches. If, if your hand causes you to sin, chop it off. And so Garrison's looking at this, and he's like, well, slavery is sin. Why are we calling for it to be repented of, like, piecemeal, gradually? That seems like if we don't cut it off entirely, it's always going to be there. And then he also looks at, you know, auction blocks and he's just, he's just reflecting on it. And he's like, it doesn't make sense. If I apply the golden rule to the slave issue, it doesn't make sense. Like I would not want people calling for my gradual abolition or saying, we're going to set you free, but only if we can deport you. So he begins really looking into the colonization movement. He becomes convinced that it's, it's not rooted in, um, uh, just principles that it is rooted in a form of racism of deep deporting free blacks that the, that the motives to maybe end slavery are getting all mixed up. So between 1829 and when he gets the uh, editorship of his own paper, he's decided, wow, I've been pr promoting some very evil things. And so as he calls it in that, that quote you read pernicious, he unref unreflectingly adopted this pernicious, you know, um, doctrine of gradual abolition. That he had to ask pardon of God for. Yeah. And, and I mean, like we're talking like, Hey, I have my new paper right out the bat. I'm going to tell you, I used to hold this bad view. I publicly confess it to God, my country and the slaves. And, and, and then that's the context for the, now I'm not going to be moderate. I am going to call slavery what it is. And I'm going to call for its total and immediate abolition. And that's what the liberator became issue after issue. I think it was published every, every week from when he started it to the, to when he, when he ended it after the civil war and after the 13th amendment. Um, I don't know if we're going to be able to do a weekly podcast, but that would be epic. But no matter what his audience, no matter what happened, Garrison never sort of uh, left this call for total and immediate abolition. But yeah, I think he had to repent of it first and then move forward in it. Um, and that was considered harsh. Like, who is he being harsh to? It's all the anti-slavery northerners who are gradualist. They're picking up this paper and they're reading a guy saying, I used to hold that pernicious doctrine that you hold. Mm -hmm. I think they would come back and say something like, "Oh, you know, we do want to, we do want slavery abolished. We do want to get rid of it entirely, but we have to do it in steps because yeah. we can't have the whole thing right now." Yeah, and it's like exactly paralleled to the incremental. Yeah, it's exa today. exactly what we face today. And on top of that, they would say, "And by the way, you're putting it too harsh." And uh, so that's why he says, "Listen, I'm going to get rid of this gradualism, and I'm going to, I'm going to tell it like it is." 
the whole harsh is truth, uncompromising is justice. What was the, you know, tell the, uh, tell the man whose house is on fire to give a moderate alarm, you know, tell the man whose wife is being raped to, you know, <laughs> to, to just moderately push off the ravisher or whatever. And so I think that, that Garrison is just sort of resolved here to confess his own sins and, and move forward. Yeah. I think another point that's very important to make there, and a lot of people may have already made this connection, but who is he being harsh towards, right? Who, who needs to be rebuked in a way that is as harsh as justice. Um, and there's kind of, uh, you, this connection may have already been made, but there's another uh, book that he wrote actually that says exactly who needs to be rebuked as harsh yep. as justice. And so Garrison in 1832, so this is a year after the liberator, he wrote thoughts on African colonization in this book, which is obviously a response to the American colonization society, the incrementalist movement of the day, Garrison writes, little boldness is needed to assail the opinions and practices of notoriously wicked men but to rebuke the great and the good men for their conduct and to impeach their discernment is the highest effort of moral courage. Yeah. Right. And so it's like slavery. Okay. Sin, obviously, obviously it's a sin. Yeah. Right. E- easy. That should not even be a question, even though it was a question among Christians at the time, it shouldn't have been, it's easily a sin, yeah. but who else needs to be? And that's what takes more courage. And it's really is more important. Yeah. Right. It's the incrementalist needs yeah. to be rebuked. Guys who are otherwise good and like, I mean, if you want to go to, to, to today, it's very easy to stand up and preach a sanctity of life sermon and say, selling baby body parts is bad. And look how evil these people are. They're wicked. Uh, you know, they're, they're, you know, butchering babies. And like, you can stand up and denounce the, the abortionist. But what about the politician who is, you know, got, he's in good standing at his church. He speaks at the crisis pregnancy center banquets. He's hundred percent pro-life, but whenever a bill of total and immediate abolition is put before him to vote, he doesn't vote for it and says that he can't because the Supreme court has ruled that abortion is the law of the land. And that guy is the guy responsible for keeping abortion legal. The very thing that he denounces. Now, a lot of people have no problem with someone denouncing like Larry Burns, the abortionist in Norman. No problem. That's fine. But if you denounce Senator Greg Treat, who is the guy who allows Larry Burns to kill children, all of a sudden you're going after somebody on your team. He's the pro-life incrementalist who allows Larry Burns to murder children. He is a pro-life incrementalist who thinks that abolitionists are being too harsh, that abolitionists shouldn't be drawing a line. We're all on the same team, all these things. And so Garrison is actually at that time rebuking the same kind of people that I think abolitionists over the past decade in America, in our context today, have been um, rebuking. Um, But the language that Garrison, it wasn't just the gradualist, the incrementalist, the regulationist of slavery. It was also sort of there at that time, and I think this is an important po- um, point here because um, scholars, historians will always look and say, why was Garrison's language this way? People had, had managed to talk about slavery being bad without being so brutal about it. And sometimes they'll say, because he was, he, he was so incendiary that he, it led to slave insurrections and brought on the Civil War and all this kind of stuff. Well, like, why was his language this way? Um, and it's very clear to scholars who've read his letters, his speeches, and who are also aware, to the, aware of the word of God, that Garrison was modeling his language after the biblical prophets. Um, he, was, he, was, he was looking at slavery and his own country the way that like Isaiah looked at the people of Israel in his time. And so uh, one of the quotes I just printed out here, this is just very, this is very common sort of thing that, that Garrison would say even though it has nothing to do with incrementalism and regulationism, uh, this is the kind of thing he would say that people think is too harsh or uncalled for. He says, quote, um, the American church is stained with the blood of the souls of poor innocents and holds the keys to the great prison of oppression. And she can never go forth to millennial triumph until she wash her hands from the blood, open the prison door and let the oppressed go free. Now this far in you know, today we look back and say like, well, yeah, he's right. Like the church had the power to abolish abortion slavery. and or, yeah, slavery. See, I get, get it all mixed up, but they had the power to do this. 
Um, and their, I, their apathy, their silence, their whatever, you know, it needed to be called out. Their hands were covered in blood and everything. But at the time when he says this, he sounds, he's, he's quoting Isaiah. He's mm-hmm. saying, your hands are covered with blood. Uh, you know, the interesting thing is like just a proof of how offensive this is today is just to ask somebody who says they're pro-life, what are you doing about abortion now? Like, what are you practically doing about abortion? Yeah. And they get really defensive about that kind of thing. They don't want you to be asking them. Well, it's not my calling. Like, don't be, don't be saying that to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, all kinds of excuses come out then because, and this is the same kind of thing. It's like, he's pointing to the people who are saying, oh, you know, we're not on the side of slavery. We don't want to be a part of that. Yeah. We're donating our money. I'd never get an abortion myself. Yeah. That blood's not on my hands. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you got uh, you got your post. That there's a popular Christian Facebook group. You got your post. You you know you, yeah. s- you said like yeah. you know babies are being murdered. You know what are you doing about it today? And you got like yeah. people get mad at you. What was it they said? They said you're. That was a binding a Christian's conscience. Yeah. So that's uh, you know I'm basically just applying the golden rule to what they're doing about abortion to abortion yeah. and. You know, apparently that's something we can't do. Yeah, and 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 we've been in this, you know, certainly in this battle for a long time, and I feel like any time that I say something, whatever you did not do for the least of these, you did not do for him. I mean, it's like people are like, man, how dare you apply that verse to me? If you say like the one that was really controversial early on in the abolition movement today was the idea that um, you know this question of does God hate our worship. You know, abolitionists were started started to say, okay, we live in a country. There's a hundred million professing born again Christians, hundreds of thousands of Bible believing churches that count as Bible believing churches, and yet we have child sacrifice going on every minute of every day in the presence of all these steeples. And so we show up on Sunday mornings, we sing songs, we pray, we worship God. But if you really get serious about the Word of God and you look at like what God cares about as it's expressed through His prophets. It's right there in Isaiah 1, Jeremiah 7, Amos 5, like this, like God does not hear the prayers or love the worship, accept the worship of people who do not seek to establish justice. Mm -hmm. It's it's Isaiah 1. It's like, why? You lift your hands to me in prayer, but they're full of blood. Yeah. And he says, go establish justice for the fatherless. I think that point is so easy to... To, so hard to see now, but so easy to see when you take any exor- uh, you know, historical example of it. Yeah. It's like you're talking about the Holocaust and you say, is there obligation to do something or to do nothing? Like, do we commend the people who did nothing about the Holocaust and think yeah. they had a different calling? Or do we say they were wicked for not doing anything yeah. about it and they're the main people to blame for it? Yeah. It's like easy. Yeah. You, the, you, the, you go to the American Holocaust Museum in, in Washington, D.C., there's like a whole section on people who ignored their neighbors, Mm -hmm. you know, and you're like, well, it's not just the Nazis who are the problems. It's these people who like turned a blind eye as the Jews were being carted away. Yeah. And, and, and you don't expect atheists to not live by atheistic examples, but you expect the Christians to not go along with the atheistic principles that are, you know, permeating the culture. And it's all, and it is easier to look at it. Like today you look back and you see like a scene of a slave auction where like, of uh, someone's buying someone's wife and the, uh, you know, and a uh, mother and, and a child and a mother are going to be separated because the child's being sold down the river. And, and we think, Oh my gosh, what, why were the Christians? Well, a lot of the Christians were doing this and those who weren't doing this, which maybe actually most of them, I mean, it, you know, there's statistically speaking, lots of people were just seeing this going on and just tolerating it. You know, they didn't, it, for some, it just didn't dawn on them. Like, uh, we love the family and we think that, we, it, that that's the key. It's the, it's the, the beautiful thing God made. It's the foundations of society, the family. But sometimes, you know, if you have to sell someone's mom, <laughs> you know? And so, but like, we look back on that and it's easy. But when Garrison came on and said, listen, your hands are covered in blood. That was offensive. They're like, how dare you call me to repent? political cartoons like would attribute this idea to Satan. Like Garrison was, Satan was whispering in his ear, like, you know, the doctrine of immediate abolition. Like this was coming from the devil now, you know, or that he was, that he was going to cause churches to split. He hated the church and all this kind of stuff. When really we look at it today and we're like, no, he is actually right. 
their hands were covered in blood. They should have done something about it. And uh, of course he says, she'll never go forth to millennial triumph. I mean, he's saying that like the church of the living God is supposed to write these things, correct oppression and stuff. So my point though, is that he is, he's not, he's not some kind of like just mean person. He's just somebody who had steeped himself in the word of God. And he just spoke, he, he just adopted the language of the prophets and applied it to a situation. And, and he was not the only abolitionist to do this. So, so that's William Lloyd Garrison. That's the liberator. He comes on the scene. Slavery is not just wrong, but how it's being fought is wrong and um, repents of that way. And then says, we're going to go forward and we're going to, we're going to fight for the doctrine of immediatism. I thought he just made cupcakes for people and they changed their mind on slavery. Yeah. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> Yeah, you mentioned it. Should we do like a cupcake drive or something? Yeah, or, maybe. Like, yeah, cupcakes and, you know, certain th- like I, I remember, you know, or not remember, I wasn't there. But like when you read sort of the Declaration of Sentiments, they, they will be like, listen, slaveholding is a crime. Like, it's a crime. It's always a, and everywhere. Always and everywhere a crime. It is a capital crime. Man stealing is a capital crime. So in the word of God, Man stealing is a capital crime. So Garrison would say it plain, but then would always follow it up with like, but as, as for us, I say, repent and go and sin no more. Like he says in that thing. So he is speaking the truth, but then also offering sort of the gospel of grace. So it wasn't just sort of like a just harsh, just that, but yeah, no, nothing like let's bake some cupcakes, you know, we'll catch more flies with honey or whatever, which I never understood why people wanted to catch flies. I don't know. But anyway, no, no, no. So, so uh, yeah, so our show is going to follow the Liberator in both that kind of tone. Uh, like, we don't want to be, we don't want to be just mean jerks. Um, just sometimes, the heck sometimes. I mean, I think maybe naturally I want to sometimes be a mean jerk. <laughs> like, when I get to the office... And I see you guys. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. It's tempting. No, I'm sure it's t- the other way around. It's like, finally, you came into the office. But yeah, natural. That. I wasn't going to say it, but now that you said it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, when is that, when is that mean jerk going to get to the office? But I mean, I think naturally we, there's that propensity maybe, but I think as a movement and certainly our organization and us as individuals, we don't want to be harsh because it's fun or mean because, you know, somehow it gets more likes or something, something like that. Um, we want to be as harsh as is necessary, as harsh to what it is that we're talking about. Um, and you know, and, and speak about things truly. Right. And that kind of raises the question, you know, obviously it's appropriate almost any degree of verbal harshness toward the defenders of abortion is obviously justified. And so, but the question that a lot of people will have is, well, the people who were kind of, you know, almost there, right? The probably incrementalists, they're not entirely against you, right? And so why why is harshness appropriate for them as well? Yeah, you're going to alienate them. Right, you're going to yeah. alienate them. You know, it's all on the we're all going for the same goal, all all that all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, but the reality is, and this is something, you know, uh, and we'll get into this in m- more detail in future episodes. Yeah. Um, but when 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 you first told me about the, you know, back before I was still a pro-life, when you first told me about the pro-life lobbyists who were opposing abolition and the reasons they were doing it, I didn't believe you. I didn't, yeah. I thought this guy's exaggerating something, you know, there's no way yeah. that the Oklahomans for Life is the primary opposition and they're doing it for these insane reasons. There's no way. Yeah. And then I see the video, right? And so it, like in a state like Oklahoma, we have super majority pro-lifers in the state house, super majority in the state Senate. We have pro-life governor, pro-life lieutenant governor, pro-life attorney general, pro-lifers everywhere. Yeah. Every level of government they have all the power dominating, and they yep. couldn't get elected without saying they're pro life too. It's like yeah, it's, it, it's because it reflects the state of the people. You you can actually add to that the population. A majority of the population's pro life. Super majority. Super yeah. majority. Yeah. Yep. So you, so you've got you've got this situation where it's like, why are you being so mean to the pro lifers? And you're like, okay, well let's just let, let's back up here. Should I be mean to the people keeping abortion legal? And so the pro lifers like, well, yeah, abortion is this cruel mass murderous thing like so i i can denounce abortion and i can denounce the people who are keeping abortion legal 
Like, yeah, well, they're always thinking Planned Parenthood, NARAL, or whatever, the ACLU. So I can be harsh against those things. Well, in the state of Oklahoma, the people keeping abortion legal, Mm -hmm. and it's not just Oklahoma, it's like tons, it's like 10, 15 states. Texas, Idaho, Indiana, Alaska. in, In all these states where bills of abolition are being drafted, filed, and people are rallying behind them, it's usually you've got a Republican pro-lifer in the governor's office, Republican pro-lifer sitting in the charge of the Senate, the House. I mean, sometimes, like in Oklahoma, it's everything. Yeah. Like the like Planned Parenthood has zero power. Democrats, liberals, they don't have any power. Abortion's not legal in Oklahoma because of the liberals. It's got to be so depressing to be a state senator in the in the Senate who's a Democrat. So why am I here? Yeah, what am I even doing? <laughs> I'm just here to watch all the Republicans just, like, Do be inconsistent hypocrites and— <laughs> and watch Joseph Silk roast them. Yeah. Hey. Oh, no, yeah. Some of the Democrats are like, well, I don't really understand what's going on, but this is kind of funny. Like, I mean, like a Democrat, like, leaked a document to me. It was like, uh, check this out. Tony Lowinger is actually telling all the other Republicans to, like, you know, you know, Not work, abolish behind, abortion. Yeah, work behind the scenes to, to keep Senator Silk's bill dead. Um, but, yeah, it's 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 – People say you're being too harsh. Well, if you're allowed to be harsh against the people keeping abortion legal, it's going to be against these, these pro-life leaders. They're the ones who are doing it. And, and like the quote you read, it, yes, it's easy to denounce the evildoer. But these are the evildoers. The other thing is, like, if we are going to, I mean, let's, let's, Garrison's great, Liberator's great. But, like, if we're going to be biblical Christians today, what approach should we have towards laws which show partiality towards some people over others. Uh, whenever people say, like, listen, I'm going to write a law. It's going to protect this person, this person, this person. But fatherless children, well, they can just go to the wall. Like, what what does the Bible say about that? Well, the, like, it's very, I mean, the same thing that motivated Garrison should motivate us. The Spirit of God, speaking through Isaiah, he said, woe to you. Woe to those who write iniquitous decrees who make the fatherless pray. So whenever a pro-life legislator in a pro-life state writes a bill and he puts in the line, um, you know, some kind of like, except for in the case of rape, like he's giving over, he's like literally writing, you can punish a child to death for the sins of his or her father. What are we supposed to say? That is iniquitous decree. Woe to you. That's like the most damning thing that you can say in the word of God. When Jesus dealt with the Pharisees or the Sadducees, he was like, woe to you, Mm -hmm. you brood of vipers. This is harsh, denunciatory language. And so I think that that's how we have to, and, and, and and it's not being, you know, Jesus wasn't harsh to the prostitutes. You know, he wasn't harsh to the tax collectors. Because like in Oklahoma, I mean, like, you have the bad, you have the bad people doing bad things. Then you have the good people who say they're doing good things who are doing bad things and they're doing it and calling it good. They're doing evil things, calling it good. And furthermore, and maybe we should have, you know, covered this earlier, but we can back up to it. We live in a culture where a majority of these Christians do legitimately hate abortion and are looking to do something. And the leaders they're looking to give them all these iniquitous decrees. Vote for me, elect me, I will abolish abortion or whatever. I will I will fight abortion. I'm to quote Greg Treat, I'm getting into politics to fight abortion. And so the person thinks I'm going to support this guy. He's going to fight abortion. He's going to protect the babies. And then he gets up there and he puts forward a bill saying, if in the event that the Supreme Court at some future time allows us to, then I will abolish abortion. And, and then all that sort of desire to fight abortion of his followers and his voters and his funders and the people that go to church with him and all that kind of stuff gets channeled behind that iniquitous decree. Mm-hmm. And, and, then, and then you've got all this energy that would be spent on abolition being delayed or, you know, kind of, you know, Put into in another it. direction. Yeah. And that's what keeps it legal. That's evil. So that has to be mm-hmm. called out. I think there are it's a few, like the Pharisee. Yeah. I think there are a few examples of something that's a, a fruitless deed of darkness than something like an pr- incremental bill that's been going on for 47 years that doesn't do anything. Yeah. Definitely. Fru- fruitless entirely. Like there's no yeah. nothing good coming from it. 
That's Ephesians 5, 10, 5, 11. What is it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Expose the unfruitful deeds of darkness. Mm-hmm. You, like the, I mean, I like how you put that. It's, it's, you know, you can't like bill after bill after bill that distracts Christians from doing what they ought to do that has literally written in it, like, you can't murder babies with forceps, but you can murder them with suction devices. And then you call it good and you celebrate it and you raise a bunch of money. Mm-hmm. And you do that year after year after year after year. And then abolitionists come along and say, hey, is abortion murder? And everyone's like, yeah. I was like, well, then let's just criminalize it. Mm-hmm. Let's extend the laws against murder to all people. And you come along and you do that. And then the people behind those bills are like, you abolitionists are bad. Yeah. Well, no, they are, they are doing something that is unfruitful in a very practical, the pragmatically speaking it's, and it is keeping darkness um, running amok. Yeah. And just so, just so all you guys know that we're not saying this like theoretically or, or, or without, uh, without good warrant to say this, like a, a really good example of this was last year. So there's the abolition of a bill, the abolition of abortion in Texas Act, mm-hmm. and it gets assigned to the committee chaired by Jeff Leach on February 25th. Now, Jeff Leach already has decided he's not going to allow the, the bill out of the committee. The bill is not going to pass his committee. Yeah. But he knows, well, if I if I you know get in the way of a bill called the Abolition of Abortion Texas Act, well, all these you know Christian pro-life anti-abortion people, yeah. they're going to be mad at me. Yeah, he's a politician. Right. And so he's like, okay, well, how can I, you know, how can I, how can I get myself out of this? And so 10 days later on March 7th, 2019, he authors the Born Alive Infant Protection Act. And what this bill does is, is virtually nothing. It it doesn't even, it doesn't (laughs) even make it murder to kill a baby after they're born. All it does is it increases the fine for killing a baby. after. But it has nothing to do with abortion. Right. If the baby survives abortion, you have to protect them. Well, I mean, that seems like a proportion. If not, you're going to be fine. Doesn't it? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's the sort of thing. Yeah. That's that's like that's the moderate thing. Yeah, I mean it, it's like that. No, that de- that needs to be denounced as as an evil, wicked thing. Right. And the fact that what you're bringing up is that here it is. There's a bill of abolition. It's before him. He has the ability to pass it to the floor. If it goes to the floor, all these pro life politicians in Texas are going to have to support it or face losing in their their upcoming, right. um, uh, you know, reelection campaigns. So he kills that bill, but then. Got to do something. He writes this other thing. It's in the place of, and what does he do? He, they pass it through. They have the big podium. They have the, the lo, they have all the pro-life organizations come support it. There's the photo ops. There's the whole thing. And then he becomes a pro-life hero of the year or something. Yeah, he, he gets to speak at the Austin March for Life. Uh, he gets Texas Alliance for Life's Courageous Defense of Life Award. The, yeah. whole, the whole nine yards. He, he, is, he is the pro-life hero of Texas in the eyes of the pro-life establishment. That is yeah. what he was held up as. Yeah. And he is literally the man who kept abortion legal yeah. in Texas. Yeah. And and he ought to be, and these are all public sins. Yeah. They're all public. I mean, it's a public injustice, but it's all done in this sort of like, uh, we're winning mm-hmm. sort of thing. But in Texas, just like in Oklahoma, they could get it done. At the time, there's literally the governor of Texas who says, to a dying abolitionist, I'm going to grant this wish and, and seek to abolish abortion in Texas. Yeah. I mean, these are wicked, wicked people. Yeah. And like no one calls them that. And they get to run around in our culture as heroes. Among Christians. Among Christians. Who don't understand Don't the get it. Yeah. yeah. And so, yes, to cut through all of that, you have to call a spade a spade. Yeah. I Jeff think- Leach. I think the nagging question, too, for people watching this is going to be, well, you know, they don't really have the authority to abolish it because the Supreme Court said, you know, it's, it's already yeah. done, right? How can we go, how can we, you know, go and defy them when the Supreme mm. Court has already spoken right. and, on and it? And this is what uh, Texas Alliance for Life, the group that gave Jeff Leach the award, the director of Texas Alliance for Life, a guy named Jeff Poyman, he, he opposed the abolition of abortion in Texas Act. And what he said to explain his opposition, what he told the, the I think it was the, the Houston Chronicle, he told them, we can no sooner defy the Supreme Court than we could defy the force of gravity. Yeah. Right, that's, that's nuts. So, so then an abolitionist comes along and says, well, you're an idolater, which that's harsh. But that's exactly what he is. Yeah, he's, he's, and, he's equating our, our submission to the Supreme Court. He's equating that to what our submission is to the law of gravity. Right? He's saying you are unconditionally under yep. the authority of the Supreme Court as if it's 
they're the authority of nature, the authority of God, yeah. is I what think, he's saying there. Yeah. Uh, well, but, the point that I think really got me, too, is like, what if someone said, we're going to kill your child, and you can't do anything about it, who has the authority to say that you're, you know, you have to be constrained in that? Like, you, you can't do anything about it. It's like, of course, no one has the authority to say that. Right. God is the one who grants life. He's the one who can take it. No one else. Right. You don't have that authority. It's not in the Constitution. If yeah. it was, who cares? We're not going to obey the Constitution. Yeah. Uh, the the only authority they have is what we give them. Yeah. I mean, I mean, what is the what's the what's the famous Frederick Douglass one? The limits. Yeah. The, How's that go? The the, the limits on the tyrant are prescribed by the patience of those being oppressed, or something along those lines. Yeah. And so uh, you think about that's what's going on here. Yeah. You you say why. Why is everyone submitting to the Supreme Court? Why is the Supreme Court so tyrannical? Why are we all so fear? Well, it's like, it's all of our, it's all our gradualism. It's all our incrementalism and our regulationism. It's like, we are, we are basically saying, well, as long as we get to do this and this and that, you know. We're as committed so. to stare decisis as they are. So, yeah, if it were the ones, we're, we're trying to denounce it, but then we're like, oh, let's just go along with it. You know? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and so I think, I mean, I think one, a lot of these topics we're going to have to deal with in their entirety on on other episodes. But once you become very convinced that there are certain things that are, that are the crux to this issue, because I think a lot of just well-meaning, um, and I'm speaking primarily of, you know, Christians who, who've got the spirit of God in them. Um, they are looking at these people and they think they're good. I mean, this guy's being called a pro-life hero. He must be a pro-life hero. Um, this organization that I'm giving money to, like, they would never equate the Supreme Court's opinions with the law of gravity. They would never say, obey man, not God. But they don't think about it. So when they read that, they just think, well, yeah, that's a good point. Poyman's got a good point. But someone has to come along and say, no, Poyman is saying, obey man, not God. The laws of man are like the laws of gravity and the laws of God are just for pretty memes on your Facebook page. Like that sort of nonsense, we have to hold it up and say that's nonsense, you know? And so the liberator, whenever it came on the scene back in uh, the 1830s, that's what it was devoted to. You know, I've read some of the letters uh, that Garrison is writing. Garrison is just, you know, he's been in, he's been in jail for like seven weeks um, because, you know, he had the audacity to call out, you know, somebody who was, uh, you know, helping slavery, the slave trade continue. And, you know, he, he was in, he was being charged by, as a libeler and as a slanderer. And while he's in his jail cell, he's like, I'm in jail for like holding the declaration of independence that all men are created equal. This is absurd. When I get out, I'm going to start a paper and anyone, you know, anyone who's for slavery, apologizing, justifying it, you know, doing anything to keep it going for a single hour, I'm going to call out because it is that, that wicked proportionally, I ought to be foaming at the mouth against this. And so should you. And so whenever it came on the scene, a lot of people immediately thought, whoa, madman, fanatic, crazy, but to very many people. Mm -hmm. And it was slow is, you know, small beginnings. More people are going to watch this liberator podcast than, uh, picked up the liberator when if it came out. Lucky. If we're lucky. Well, no, I mean, literally, and it's going to be a small number. It's, I'm just kidding. Yeah. It's going to, it's going to be a small number. I mean, mm -hmm. we're not going to have a huge reach just right off the bat, but it's still like he reached a very small crowd, whoever he could reach, but it resonated with people. People looked at it and said, wait, Why? Why incremental? Of course, it resonated most with, uh, you know, the African slave and the free blacks in the north who said, yeah, we're not on board with colonization and all that kind of stuff. Didn't, so didn't Garrison say the best compliment he was ever paid was when he uh, was mistaken for a black man when he met one of the England abolitionists? Oh, <laughs> well, yeah. It, like from reading you, I thought I always thought you were black. <laughs> yeah. No, my favorite thing is that Garrison, who's always being, uh, you know, called this fanatical mean person. He's on a train ride and uh, I can't remember where he's going or whatever. And he's sitting there and he's having this conversation with someone about abolitionist slavery. And the person brings up, well, you know, I know there's these abolitionists, they call for total and immediate abolition. And then there's the colonization, the more realistic, practical grad. I'm one of those. And then 
Garrison says, well, have you thought about this, this, this? And they have this delightful conversation about the principles of abolition and how they're better than the principles of um, gradualism. And, uh, and at the end of the train ride, the guy's like, man, if all the abolitionists were like as kind and as well thought out and able to express it as you, then I would, I would, I would have probably been an abolitionist. And then Garrison's like, well, wh- like, whatever do you mean? And the guy says, well, there's this crazy man in Boston named William Lloyd Garrison. He's just, he's just out of control, mean. Like, man, I mean, if I ever met that guy, I'd want to punch him. You know, I don't know if this is, I'm p- kind of paraphrasing it. It's like, this guy's really, really bad. Ah, and he's like, well, you're talking to him. <laughs> I think Garrison's like, well, you are talking to him. And, it, and that's the truth. It's like denouncing sort of an idea, one of the ways, and, and we see this with the Oklahoma Senate for sure. Uh, when you speak truth to power and you expose these corrupt politicians, the, the lying tongues who preach peace, peace when there is no peace, when you do this, they don't want to deal with the arguments. They don't want to deal with like Senate Bill 13 and what it actually says. They want to lie about it, misrepresent it, and then want to say that all the people who are for it are crazy. Or like Antifa. Or cultists. Yeah, you guys are Antifa. You're like Westboro Baptist. It's like, am I like Westboro Baptist because I simply want the laws against murder applied equally to all people? No. You know, so you're the ones talking about punching us and wanting to go outside and you're violent and breathing violence and all that kind of stuff. But... So that's going to be, I think, the tone that we that we want to deal with here because we don't want to. We know that you know, just like Harrison's saying, we know that lots of people are going to be like, uh, "I like free the states, but I just I think, I think I have a problem." They they put it on a little, they put a little too much heat on it, and I'd say, I don't think we're putting enough heat on it. We're literally talking about little image bearers of God being like shredded or burnt or suffocated constantly and under the covering of these unjust laws that are passed by pro-lifers and done by their own parents too. Yeah. It's like parents are killing their children with permission of Republican conservative pro-life legislators Mm -hmm. and a governor who won't do anything about it. So yes, they all need to be denounced. Yeah. And another important point to, to get to, um, is is a, is a, it's another quote of Garrison's, and it's the one uh, you were talking about it, talking about earlier before we started the podcast about the the fall of slavery and the fall of uh, American colonization going down together. Yeah, um, I, don't, I don't know if you have that on you or if we can paraphrase it. Yeah, um, but uh, yeah, basically Garrison said that I I view I view the downfall of the American colonization mm. society of the anti-slavery incrementalists. I view that I view their fall and the fall of slavery as one and the same. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think it was clear then, but I think it's even more clear now. Yeah. Like, you know, people are like, don't be harsh on the pro-life movement. They're your allies. No, factually, they're our enemies. They're killing the bills of abolition. They're running against the abolitionist candidates. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, a, it's an abolitionist in a gubernatorial primary who's being, you know, you know uh, beaten by a pro-lifer who says... I'm not going to abolish abortion because of the Supreme Court. And he's like, well, I'm going to stand up to the Supreme Court, tell him to pound sand. We're going to abolish abortion within our borders and see what kind of army the Supreme Court has. They don't, you know. And so, uh, you know, the bill of abolition is destroyed or is ignored by these pro-lifers. How do we get abortion to be criminalized in a state like Oklahoma? It's not by doing away with the pro-choice establishment. It's doing away with the pro-life establishment. Right. And it's super clear. An important distinction to make there is um, we don't necessarily, when we say destroy the pro-life, pro-life establishment, we're not necessarily, we, we don't want to destroy people's careers, right. reputations any more than is necessary until they embrace a correct yeah. ideology or we're going to be harsh. But we're not trying to destroy people, right? When yeah. we say destroy the pro-life movement, we're talking about destroy the pro-life establishment. We're talking about destroying an ideology. An yeah. ideology uh, a, a collection of, of, of sentiments that when applied are keeping abortion legal incrementalism, the ideology, incremental bills, incremental politicians and lobbyists are the ones keeping abortion legal. Yeah. And so that those sentiments, that, um, that ideology is what needs to be destroyed. Yeah. And the, the, the 
abolition of, of abortion in Oklahoma is inextricably linked to the rejection of incrementalism by the people of Oklahoma, by the mm-hmm. magistrates of Oklahoma. Yeah. That, those two things are inextricably linked. Yeah. And, and, and any of the organizations or figures, people, or anything like that, it would be better that they just repented and joined us. That's, yeah. it's, that's what it's see. that. I mean, that's what's ultimately going to be necessary, either that they would repent, embrace abolitionism, and sort of champion the cause of justice, or be replaced by those who do. But yeah, it's not the, it's not the specific person; it's the scheme they put forward. Mm-hmm. So if you want to think about it, like there's 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 five bills that are anti-abortion bills put before the 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 legislature, and four of them are iniquitous decrees, and one of them is a bill of abolition. We need to destroy those iniquitous. We need to take them off the table. They, mm-hmm. they those don't need to be something that anybody thinks well of. Yeah. Um, and so those have to like, and, and as long as people do think well of them, it's, yeah, it's, it's next to impossible to get an abolition bill passed because yeah. if, if you, if you give them, right. if you give politicians the option to, to, to take the, take the lesser, easier option that doesn't bring as much, yeah as much fr- friction with the federal government, as much friction with, with pro boards, yeah. whatever they're going to take it. Yeah. And so you have to take the compromise options off the table. Yeah. You're not going to get abolition passed. And that's the reason another garrison quote, mm-hmm. um, I can call it to mind. Uh, this was this was he was reading the Declaration of Sentiments to to a uh, a crowd of abolitionists in 1832, and I'll go uh, as close of a verbatim as I can go off the top of my head. He says, "We regard as cruel, delusive, and dangerous any scheme of expatriation which pretends to aid right in in the." Uh, does it go from there? Pret- pretends, pretends to aid in the emancipation of the slaves. Right, in the emancipation of the slaves or serve as a substitute for the total and immediate yeah. abolition of slavery. Yeah. Um, and so as long as there are substitutes that they can put forward in the place of abolition and still be celebrated yeah. for it, that's what they're going to do, yeah. and abortion is going to stay legal. Yeah. You've and, got to kill the substitutes. Yeah, and, and it is a delusion. Yeah. I mean, people are celebrating these things. And so, and, and you say, well, well, how do you destroy them? Like, like how, how you know what one why are they being put forward i mean that does reveal something like what you're saying sometimes and we've seen it in oklahoma we've seen it in texas where you have the bill of abolition and all the people are saying this is the bill we want and then like the pro tem of the senate will gut some other bill and put forward a fake bill like it's a straight up fake bill but it looks pro life and he puts it forward and and when he did that you know praise god people booed him and he ran out of that. Like you know, he put his little tail between his legs and he scurried out of that committee. And, and that was awesome. And that was, if someone was like, is, is that justified? Because they were very much like these abolitionists are wrong. Well, no, we have a man who puts forward this fake bill in its place. And you say, well, but are you right to try to destroy it? Well, I mean, think about this like scripturally. So, you know, you say, um, you know, one of the bills this last time they put forward a bill basically saying, uh, if a baby, you can detect brain waves or a fetal heartbeat, then they should be protected. And in the debate and the discussion about it, um, the guy basically said that, you know, he believed that it need to be abolished after brain waves because that's whenever like the, the baby, you know, is valuable and should be protected or made he, in the image of God. That's whenever life begin life begins at a beating heart. Or that, that's what begins. he said. He says, he said the earliest detector that we know of to detect life his brainwaves. His brainwaves. And so, and so, and so he's sitting say, senator say, is that something that. Yeah. Insane? yeah. And he's saying this and everyone just in all the pro-lifers are like, mm-hmm, yeah. and all the abolitionists are like, well, yeah, but you have the power to abolish it from the moment of conception. But like, why is he shifting? Well, like, let's look at this. That is a speculation raised up against the knowledge of God. Scripture is very clear. The image of God, like we're talking about whenever Christ emptied himself and he began as a human, it was as an as a, as a embryonic human being. When, you know, we, Christ was in the womb, it, he, was, he was incarnate before brainwaves and heartbeat and all that kind of stuff. And everyone's like, life begins at conception. Well, here you got a senator basically breathing lies in opposition to something good and just. And that's a speculation. And why is it being raised up? against this just good bill to abolish abortion and establish justice for the fatherless. Scripture says, destroy that speculation. Call it out. Destroy it. Smash it. We're not trying to smash Senator Paul Scott. We want him to be like, 
woe is me, I am undone. I'm putting forward rubbish, evil, wicked bills. And he knows that he's putting them forward at the behest of the leadership and that he can't, you know, all this kind of stuff. We want him to see what he's doing and repent. But that idea, that bill, we want to knock it off the table. So the only bill that they have to get behind is total and immediate abolition. So yes, Garrison is right. And I think we are right. The only way that you're going to end abortion in a state like Oklahoma is to take the pro-life movement out. It needs to be discredited entirely. You can't have the right to life people being the ones who set the agenda and say to That's all right. the voters in Oklahoma, these are good people. Like you, you need to discredit them in order for that to yeah. happen. And you and, and and try to do that without, you know, a little bit of I mean, if you can do it without being harsh. But uh, the problem is is they come along e- even if you're super nice. Mm-hmm. They will they they will come at you and, you know, you're a cultist and all this. Yeah, the ideas kind of are offensive no matter how no matter yeah. how good you are at making it easy to yeah, grasp, easy to swallow. The ideas are what are offensive in this case. Yeah. It's like telling a pro-choicer that abortion is murder. I yeah. kind of like it no matter how nice you say it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, it's, it's, I mean, because the word, like, abolition, like, we're going to criminalize this. Like, you're not allowed to do it. Like, it's going to be murder, mm-hmm. and you're going to go to jail for it. That's just offensive to people. Yeah. Say, saying it nice is not going to help. Mm-hmm. So, 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 you know, I mean, I think we're going to end up coming back to a lot of these things in future episodes. But that's going to be kind of the objective of the show regularly. Like stuff is happening along these lines all the time. Like in Texas, just recently, right? You know, you you have the right to life people saying the position of the Republican Party should be to abolish abortion gradually and pass regulations. You know, to the to the abolitionist, the position they hear the the position of the Republican Party should to be be to delay the abolition of abortion, try to make it a little more safe, a little more rare while it's legal, and to not abolish abortion when we have the power and ability to do it. Well, the abolitionists are saying, no, the position should be total and immediate abolition of abortion is murder. Straight up. Defy, you know, federal court rulings and do this in the state of Texas. Come and take it, you know. And so uh, that's going on now. So, like, this show is going to be regularly, you know, probably to begin with, week in, week out, things that happen as they happen, and people are looking to say, well, is this good or is this bad? We want to speak truthfully and where necessary, harshly, starkly, harshly in the good sense. Like we're not going to, you know, uh, um, sugarcoat things. We want to say it. We don't want to lie, but we want to state it plainly. When the pro-lifer says, don't get in a tizzy about the rape exception because we're only talking about 1%. We want to say, I'm going to get in a freaking tizzy because 1% is 10,000 image bearers. And you're saying that your bill has to allow the right to murder children for the crimes of their fathers. Woe to you. That's an iniquitous decree. Repent. You're evil, right? We are going to translate it truthfully. And I think the truth to those who are unreflectingly going along may at times sound harsh. Yeah. Because I think a lot of people who've done a lot of these pro-life things, support a lot of these pro-life bills, haven't thought much about it. Mm-hmm. So we're going to try to make them think about it. Um, so yes, calling out schemes for what they are, exposing unfruitful deeds, and it's all done to wake people up from this delusion. And one other thing that's important to note, there are, there are a lot of pro-life leaders who have reflected a lot about this, and they have come down... Yeah firmly on the side of we're going to bow to the Supreme Court, yeah. whatever they say, up to and including they know what they're doing. They murder. know what we're calling for. They know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They know, they know they've, they've picked their side incrementalism, but there are a lot of people who like, like all three of us here, just, like, like William Lloyd Garrison before he, before he converted, like all of us before we converted, who are unreflectingly assenting to these ideas of bowing to the Supreme Court, to these ideas of, gradualism and incrementalism and compromise. Yeah. And 
the really, really good news is that people are starting to come along. We're starting to see, I mean, we've got two Christian conventions. We've got the Free Will Baptist and Oklahoma Baptist, which is the Southern Baptist Convention here in Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. Both have altered their platform to become immediatist on abortion, right? Both yeah. of them. Yeah, it's um, major. This, this thing is happening. I mean, the, the, you, mentioned, you mentioned Texas earlier, the, 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 the right to life and alliance for life were going against abolish abortion in Texas and the abolitionists. Yeah. The abolitionists won. Right? They yeah. outnumbered the incrementalists yes. five to one at the Texas GOP convention, and abortions at complete abolition is now an official legislative priority of the Texas yeah. Republican Party. And this is going to be like, it, it, we're going to see it among the grassroots people. Yeah. Like the, the, the regular person has no stake in keeping abortion legal. You know, it's the, it's gonna, it's gonna be difficult among the people at the top who see the writing on the wall. If abortions abolished, what, what do I do with my, I mean, they year after year put forward pro-life regulations. Of course they want that to be the legislative priority. If you abolish abortion, they're going to have to get new jobs or shift their focus to assistance only or something. And they'll also have, if, if abortion is abolished by the, the assertion of the, the state's right to stand up to the Supreme court. They'll have to admit that they spent all this time bowing to the Supreme Court. That ended up, yep. that ended up fruitless. And then this, 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 this ragtag group of people, yeah. rallying around this crazy idea that we should just <laughs> abolish abortion. Who they've worked very hard to slow down and delay. Right. I mean, it's. I mean, it. I understand the. It's, like it, you, it would be so impossible to like so hard to admit you're wrong after like forty years of yeah of of pushing back against people like us too. It's like. Yeah, the humility that it takes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like for some of these guys who have devoted, I mean, it's not just like we're not the only ones trying to like put an end to like the pro-life movement so that we can abolish abortion. The pro-life leaders are trying to make sure the abolitionist movement doesn't even get off the ground so that they can keep on fighting abortion. Mm-hmm. They want to be the ones who keep fighting abortion. I It's seemingly... Perpetuity perpetuity indefinitely they're going to do this and abolitionists are coming along and sort of saying things that I think resonate with just a regular person regular person's like well I never really thought about that holy smokes I've always just sort of unquestioningly went along with rape exceptions but now that you put it forth with some scripture I'm like wow Mm -hmm. God hates the rape exception like literally hates it and says it in his word and I never even thought about it well that pro-life leader's like I either have to admit that I was putting forth something that God hated and doing it in his name and taking people's money to support it. Like, I mean, be humble and just admit that Mm -hmm. or try to make sure that nobody listens to these people, Yeah, which is what pro-life leaders do. They spend a lot of time and a lot of energy making sure that people don't even hear us. Sort of like this slander misinformation campaign before it even gets going. And it is the, that is the last point that people want to hold on to. Cause that is the legacy there. It's like, yeah. this is the thing that defines whether or not all of my work has been good or not. Yeah. So it's like, I'm not going to admit that it's immoral. I'll, I'll defy the court maybe, but I'm not going to admit that it's immoral. Cause that is my whole legacy. Yeah. But you know, praise God, I've seen it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've seen, I've seen guys like Senator Randy Brogdon basically he, 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 I mean, I'm sitting there with him. We're filming something and he's like, I mean, he's like bawling. He's like in tears. He's like, I never would have put forward this ultrasound bill if I just had restated it truthfully. If I said, you can murder your baby if you look at an ultrasound, I would not have put forward. I just didn't see it. I didn't think about it. And then, he, and then he's sitting there and he's like, all the babies who've been murdered in Oklahoma since that time have been murdered in compliance with my bill. And he's just like, what in the world, you know, but that's that humility and it's awesome. Mm -hmm. And I think other people see that humility and that's, and it's true repentance. And that's the kind of thing that if even a guy like, you know, I mean, we're talking about the David Bullards, the Larry Boggs is the, the Greg treats, Kim Davids. That's what we're going to need. We're going to need them to go. What am, what am I doing? And we're not going to push away anybody who does that. Right. Mm -hmm. If, yeah, for, 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 for someone like, like Greg Treat or Greg McCourtney or anyone like that, who we have obviously <laughs> cartooned. Yes. Who we have, yeah. we have, we have been very, very harsh towards and they've been very, very harsh towards us. If they do the right thing, we will not push them away. It's all water in the bridge. Immediately there'll be yeah. rejoicing. Yeah, they'll, and they'll they, be rejoicing. And they may be mad and I may have yeah. to apologize, but like, you know, <laughs> the, I mean, it's one of these things where someone says, yeah. uh, you know, I'm talking to a guy, he's wanting to repent and 
all this kind of stuff. And he says, you know, just don't draw me, you know? He's like, yeah. So it's like, I've, they've, they've been a fin- you know, Garrison was a writer. He had the paper and stuff. Today we live in a world of memes and images and people don't read as much. And, and so like a guy like Greg McCourtney and Greg, Tre- I mean, I've, I've literally drawn Greg treat laying back, sitting as a King with his hand in a puppet of Greg Courtney feeding himself grapes, you know, and this is, this is pretty, this is how I see them. Now, the moment that they're like, you know what, we're going to stop ignoring the people of Oklahoma, ignoring the free will Baptists, the Southern Baptists, the Republican party. We're going to do justice. We're going to protect the preborn. I'm going to draw Greg treat like on a, you know, mounted on a steed, like destroying the dragon of abortion in Oklahoma and, you know, you know, sell t-shirts. I'm going to rally people like crazy to Greg treat, you know, and, 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 and a guy like Joseph silk, guess what he was doing? It was a heartbeat bill. The first bill seeking to abolish abortion in a state was a heartbeat bill. And we abolitionists believe that heartbeat bills are these delusive schemes. You know, you don't protect babies because they possess beating hearts. You protect them because they possess the image of God. That's why murder is wrong. But he looks at it, he hears abolition, repents almost instantly, and he's like, I'm gutting this bill, and I'm putting forward a bill of abolition. That kind of humility is what we need. And Joseph Silk was a hero to all of the abolitionist movement from there on out. Like, no one, yeah. no one held anything against and he's him. Just, and, and, and he's grown in his understanding and, and just his ability to, like, just lead on this issue. And, and he's hated for it. But the people who are hating him for it, like people who are his friends and coworkers, you know, they, I mean, we want them to repent before God for the right reasons, but they're politicians. And so we're working on them and we're exposing them. But the people, if the people in Oklahoma would shift and they had to shift for political reasons, like, you know what? I'm just, I'm just checking the wind here. It's blowing from abolition. The only way I'm getting reelected or a future gubernatorial bid or something like that is if I change. Well, we'll we'll let you do that. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I mean, not to. I, I want you to repent, but if for political reasons in the state of Oklahoma, Greg Treat has to stand up, you know, we'll be for it. There's not going to be any opposition. So it's not the opposition to the person as the person. It's an opposition to what is being done that is keeping the bloodshed going. So we're going to be as harsh as truth and as uncompromising as justice. We're not going to equivocate. We are not going to, I mean, abortion is not justifiable. It's, there's no reasonable excuse or justification to keep it legal for a single hour. Sin always and everywhere. It's always sin, everywhere sin. All the different things that people prop up as excuses, com- they, they, can, they can be assessed and looked at for what they are wicked nonsense that needs to be tossed to the side and we can figure out how, I mean, the scriptures say, uh, cease to do evil. And that's what we're trying to cease to do evil and then learn to do good, correct oppression. So that's what we want. We just want that repentance. So as we cover rulings of the Supreme court, different pro-life bills, different abolitionist campaigns that are going on. Uh, This is a podcast from Free the State, so we'll be talking about different things that we're doing, but it's presented by Free the State. So we'll be talking about different things that abolitionists are doing in Arizona and Texas and trying to uh, bring a lot of uh, unity and cohesion of thought, you know, and we want all abolitionists everywhere to be edified by this program. Um, And if you're ever confused about you know, something that's going down. We're going to think about it, speak about it, and try not to sugarcoat it. Thank you for watching the first episode of the Liberator podcast from Free the States. Now, if you like the episode, please subscribe to the Free the States channel on YouTube, like us on Facebook, and share this video with all of your friends. To learn more about abolitionism and the work that we are doing, go to freethestates.org. On that note, everything we do is made possible by our monthly members and financial donors. So please prayerfully consider donating to Free the States. Next week in episode two, I'll be talking to Sam and James about their journey from working in the pro-life movement to joining the abolitionist cause and working for Free the States. So stay tuned and we'll see you next Thursday.